All right. Thank you, Greg. Good morning. Um, when I talk, I think I might end up... Oh, the band is gone. I was going to turn around and face the band because they never... They always look at the backs of people. I thought, well, they, they need to get a front row seat. So, well, Greg asked me to, to tell my story, and I was honored by his, his asking me. Um, but I started to think about it. And uh, he said, well, uh, you got 10 minutes. I'm 68 years old, going on 69. That gives me roughly, what is it, one minute? I got to tell almost seven years of my life story. I, I probably just lost the first seven already just telling you this. But it doesn't matter because not much happened in that first seven anyway. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that confidence. So um, there's a story about a Zen master and a small boy that live in this village. And when the boy turns 14 years old, uh, he's given a horse. And everyone in the village says, isn't that wonderful? How amazing. Is he so lucky? The Zen master says, we'll see. So a couple of years go by. Uh, he's riding the horse. The horse throws him. He falls off the horse and he breaks his leg. He can't ride the horse anymore. Everybody in the village says, how sad. Uh, you know, this is unfortunate. The Zen master says, we'll see. Short time after that, that village goes to war, and all the young men of that village are conscripted into to fighting, except for our young man, because he's still got a messed up leg. And everybody in the village says, how wonderful, he's been spared, how fortunate. And the Zen master says, we'll see, exactly. And I think, um, I know this month of January, you've been talking about uh, decision making, and uh, I think you know decision making oftentimes is so results oriented. But at the end of the day, we'll see. Really, has had a big impact uh, on my life. So, uh, to give you a little little of the backstory, I met Greg um, about 1995 when we joined Bethlehem Lutheran uh, Church. And we were living a, a great life. Um, I was financially successful. I was professionally successful. We had a beautiful home between Harriet and the Creek. We, uh, our boys were, had their own sailboat on Calhoun. We're sailing every day in the summer. We were doing sailing trips. Everything was going great. In about 2004, uh, I get a notion that I want to make a change in my life. And I want to do something around the passion, a passion I had for sailing. So I contacted, I wasn't sure what to do, I contacted a gentleman who had the largest yacht dealership in the upper Midwest called Crow's Nest Yachts. I got their answering machine. I left a message, I said, I'm Reeve Hutchinson, I'm trying to make some changes in my life. If you'd like to make changes in your life, maybe we can help each other out. So I left them this rather cryptic phone message. <laughs> he called me back. I thought, okay. So I, I, he said, I'll, I'd like to talk to you. So I told my wife, I'll be gone for about an hour. I'm going to come back, and, and we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Well, I came back seven hours later, and I told her, I think we, we bought a yacht dealership. <laughs> and we did. So great. You know, it seemed like the right decision. Everything is lined up, you know, perfect. Then 2007, the recession hits. At that point... I'm stuck, multi-million dollar inventory, and I, for me to sell a, a liveaboard sailboat, a, a yacht of any sort, it's like trying to sell water to a drowning man. It's just not happening at all. And so eventually, you know, as we're hemorrhaging cash, all of our retirement savings, gone. Our portfolio, gone. And ultimately, we had to sell our house. We couldn't afford to keep our house anymore, and it was a beautiful house. But we had 20 great years of living in it and raising our children in it. But anyway, so that's all gone. And, and at that point, I'm feeling like, wow, <laughs> did I ever make the wrong decision? And I'm, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of hatred that I, I was going through. Um, and then I hear about a potential business opportunity uh, in a place called Red Cliff, Wisconsin, which is a couple miles north of Bayfield on Lake Superior. And it just happens to be an Indian reservation. 
And I went up there and I met with um, a person who today is a very close friend of mine. And I met with him for the first time. And I instantly felt some sort of a connection that I couldn't really, I couldn't really explain. Uh, it was, uh, I wanted to know more about those people. Uh, I, I, there was just an insatiable desire to, to learn, to, to find more opportunities for, for connections. And I did, and, and I ended up uh, living there in the summers, and I keep a boat up there. Uh, the business opportunity never materialized, but that's immaterial. Uh, but what we do is, is I learned um, how another people loved. I learned how another uh, culture existed. Uh, what, you know, if we say, remember the old wristbands, what would Jesus do? Well, they, they, their traditions, they live that. These are very spiritual people, in spite of the fact they didn't have organized religion going on. So three things happened while I was up there that have really kind of illustrate the relationship I have to these people and the impact it's had on my life. And, and one of them is I had heard about a tree that's located near a, a cemetery, an old cemetery. And it was tradition for some of these Native Americans that when somebody died and they were put in the earth near this tree, they would carve out a clan sign uh, in the bark of that tree. So I, I had looked for this tree for a couple of years, and I'd talked to my friend, and, and he'd, he'd never tell me where it was. He'd say, it's there, you look, you'll find it. Well, uh, one morning, it was an October morning, and it was quiet up there, there were no tourists, and I was just walking through the woods, uh, and I found the tree. And when I came up to that tree, I looked up and I recognized there was a sign of the bear clan that had been carved in the bark of this tree many years ago. And, and I put my hand on that Bear Clan sign, and it fit like a second skin on, on my hand. It was just so perfect. And instantly, instantly, without any provocation or expectation, I was sobbing with tears. And, but they weren't, they weren't sadness. It was, it was an unbridled joy that all of a sudden I said, you know, I know where, I, where my home is now. I know my heart has a home. For the first time ever, my heart has a home. And, and I heard a drum circle. I heard the beat of the drums, and it was in a faint distance. I, I, there were no drummers around. I hear this, this clucking nearby, and there was an eagle near, nearby. And I go, my gosh, this, this, is, where, this is where I connect to the ground. This is, this is my, my home. Another experience I had uh, shortly after that was we were doing a community uh, prayer walk. And it was just to myself and some tribal um, the council members uh, going through the neighborhood. It was about an eight mile walk. We started off the day uh, with, a, with a, um, uh, a drum circle and a pipe ceremony at sunrise down on the shores of Lake Superior. And then we walked through the neighborhoods and then we had a, a banquet, a feast afterwards. And I got back to the boat about four o'clock some of my dock neighbors were getting ready to have cocktails shortly. They said, well, come join us. I said, I, I can't. I'm tired. You know, I got to have a nap. Maybe if I wake up, you know, later on, I'll join you. So I, I went to the boat. I slept for about four hours. I woke up at eight o'clock. I come out and they're still yucking it up on the dock. So I walk over and I join them. They said, well, we were watching your boat. And I said, well, why were you watching my boat? And they said, well, there was an owl that came over from Basswood Island and it landed on the companionway of your boat and it sat there for about a half hour. And the companionway is kind of like the front door of the boat. So I had known enough that traditionally the owl is a messenger of death. I mean, it's not literal death. It, means, it can mean change in your life. So, but I was concerned, and I'm talking to some elders about it in the, in the weeks that followed. And finally, one of them said, well, uh, did they get a picture of it? And I said, no. They said, well, why not? And I said, well, it was, it was dark out, it was at night. Oh, well, that's different. When the owl comes at night, it's there as you're protected. So, you know, it, it turns out that the owl was my totem spirit. And he's explaining to me that that, that owl came to sit in that boat because it recognized one of its own kind. 
and it just sat on the boat to protect me. And, you know, I, and I, that owl has returned to me uh, in my dreams. And, you know, I was asleep when it arrived, but I've had many dreams about it. So the third example of, of something that really connected happened just this last summer, and probably one of the most amazing things of my life. And um, I, was, I had some people on board the boat. We were at Isle Royal. One of my passengers starts to have a stroke, and he had a, a TIA is actually what he had. And so we have to get him. We can't get a helicopter in to get him off the island fast enough. With a stroke, time is of the essence. So uh, the, uh, the Park Service has a high-speed boat. We get in that, we take him over to Grand Portage, which is another Indian reservation. And at Grand Portage, um, we get him on an ambulance and they, and they ship him to um, Grand uh, Moraine, Minnesota. Well, there was an elder Indian there that uh, helped us with our dock lines. And so after he was, my passenger was off on the, in the ambulance, I was talking to this elder and I said, you know, I didn't put any tobacco in the water today. And we talked about that and the importance of doing that. And so he went away. And a short time later, he comes back and he calls me, motions for me to come over by him. And we go off by ourselves by the edge of the lake. And he reaches into his pocket and he brings out this little black pouch. And he opens up that pouch and I can see inside, it's, it's, it's what's called Sema, which is Ojibwe prayer tobacco. So it'll have some sage, it'll have some sweet grass, it'll have some cedar, maybe some other tobaccos. And it's blended. So I reached in and I pulled out a, a pinch of it. And I told him, I said, I'll put this in the water later on. And I was thankful for that. And he said, no, no, no. I want you to have my medicine bag. And he gave me his medicine bag. And he explained to me that these plants, they've been growing and harvesting these plants for over 300 years up there. And, and I will tell you, there has been no achievement, nothing in my life honored me so close, as, as, so much as, as what he did for me um, that day. I mean, here I am, this white guy who he's never seen, seen before. And he gives me uh, his medicine, medicine bag. So uh, the way I honor him back is I've told this story. I try to tell this story almost once a day because I want other people to think about honoring others and, and simply acknowledging people is, is good enough about to, to honor them. So how does this roll up to some notion about um, decision-making? Well, you know, in my case, yeah, I made some, uh, what looked like a good decision, wait and see. No, I really made a bad decision. Wait and see. Wow, what an amazing decision. So I've, so I've kind of come to three points on, on decision making. One is, I don't think that we can make, we make all our own decisions. I know for a fact that I'm not clever enough or bright enough to have maneuvered my way into living a life now that is richer than I've ever known and, and full of love like I've never known. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we don't have enough information to see into the future. All we have is a rear view mirror. We can't really see what's gonna happen in the future. So we really don't know what, what impact ultimately uh, our decisions will have. And, and the third point about decision making is, I don't think we have a finite time of making decisions. I mean, we understand that, that we're more than just a collection of mass. We have a spirit, and that spirit is alive, and that, and that spirit doesn't get destroyed. And I think that spirit will continue to make decisions with us beyond our earthly, earthly uh, life. And um, so with that, I would leave you with a Mark Twain quote. He said, there's two most important days of a person's life. And the first example is the day you're born. And the second is the day you know why. So with that, thank you.